All right, let's get started. So uh, first and foremost, congratulations for surviving three intense days at Cisco Live. And my whole goal is to make the session light when I, as, as, as much as I can, but also very informative. And I would like to keep it as interactive as possible, right? So we are, and, and you wouldn't know, but if you look at the list of people attending the session, all of you all come from the same background, you know, with similar use cases. So don't feel shy throughout the session. Ask me questions. Let's make it as interactive as possible. So you have a question already, yeah. <laughs> so the question is, can you ask questions? Yes, you can certainly ask questions. <laughs> no, that's, that's the spirit. So you know, it's, it's truly an exciting time to be a part of the media and entertainment industry today. You know, I've, I've, I've been a network engineer doing, completely doing IT stuff for eight years of my life. And in 2016, I had the opportunity to really focus on this vertical called media and entertainment, right? So I was fortunate enough to work with pretty much, you know, the broadcast uh, providers all over the world, be it in US, Europe, and Asia. So we are here to really share with you what exactly is happening in the media and entertainment industry, and how does this impact the network, right, the IP network and the infrastructure that you build so that your organizations can successfully be, you know, transform yourself as you take upon this journey, right? So that's the goal of this session. So a quick introduction uh, to myself and my co-speaker. Well, I can't find him. Unfortunately, he, you know, he had the flu and he felt really sick. But thankfully, it's not the coronavirus. Uh, he's just having the normal, uh, normal flu. But he sends his regards. So Amar is uh, a principal uh, engineer who works in the US and very focused on media. He's part of the sales team. And myself, I, my name is Rahul Parmeshwaran. I am a technical marketing engineer. Now, I know marketing sounds marketing, but I'm actually an engineer more than, more than uh, 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 marketing. So I focus on how do you build next-gen data centers to transport video and audio. So that's my whole goal, right? And this includes a variety of use cases, right from uncompressed video production, as well as things like contribution, distribution, video head-ends, right? So pretty much everything that you all do is something that I cover from my BU. So I work, I work for the Nexus 9K business unit, so focus on NXOS, DCNM. So some of it, that you, some of the things that you're familiar with, right? So uh, in today's agenda, we will spend a lot of time talking about the transition that I spoke about, right? So what's happening in the production facility? So the production is moving from SDI to IP. So we'll begin with focusing on what does this mean for the network. And then I'll introduce you to our solution called Cisco's IP Fabric for Media. We will talk about, we will build this network together, right? So we'll build this infrastructure together. And finally, we'll talk about uh, timing. It's something that did initially keep me up, at, keep me up in the night uh, when we started this project, but I'll share with you, hey, what are the things to watch out to when you implement a protocol called PTP, which is essential, right, uh, to distribute timing in this fabric. And then towards the end of my session, I'll also talk about post-production workflows, right? So what happens after the studios? And then uh, I will reference some real customer deployments. In fact, there are a few customers in the audience who've gone through this journey. We'll talk about their deployments and share with you, right, what worked well, what didn't work well, and some of the learnings that I have personally learned in this journey. I just want to make sure that I share with you so you have this knowledge and you don't have to learn it you know, while you're implementing this network in your data center. So what's happening in the industry today, right? So the biggest transition that's happening in the media industry is the move from SDI to IP. So I just want a quick show of hands. How many of you all work for companies that produces video or audio radio stations? Right? And I'm assuming you've gone to a studio room, so there are multiple studios, production control rooms, right? Now, if you walk into these control rooms, you'll actually see a bunch of cables that, that are really thick, you know, nothing like an IP cable, stretched across long distances, and, and these are SDI cables. 
Now, what's happening in the production infrastructure is as you know, all of us want to watch video in ultra high definition, right, 4K, the infrastructure that is in place today simply cannot cater to this high definition or ultra high definition. In fact, some of our customers at the Olympic Games this year would be producing content in 8K. I don't know who's gonna watch it, but the content will be produced. Uh, and, and all of this requires the infrastructure to be dynamic, to, be, to carry a lot more bandwidth, and that is why it's natural for us to use IP. Because today, already we are 400 gig ready, right? So imagine the amount of information you can carry with a single fiber that you will not simply be able to do in the SDI world. So that's the number one reason why a lot of production, video production, is moving from this legacy technology called SDI to IP. Now, outside the video, uh, you know, especially in post-production workflows, a lot of these media assets, right, they are going from boxes to virtual machines and containers. And that's the reality. So there's another transition happening there. So it is natural for us to build an IP infrastructure so you can incorporate such workflows within your organization, right? So when you have VMs, when you have containers, that, would, that will work, that is, those are the things that will drive you to adopt IP as you build these infrastructures. And last but not the least, now, why do people like cloud? The best, or uh, the main reason why people like cloud is you can just swipe a credit card and spawn a new service. Once you're done with that service, just say, hey, close that service. So this whole concept of resource sharing, right? It's not like you build a dedicated environment for one thing, and maybe you're using it two hours every week. So that whole model of creating resources that you can share comes naturally with IP. In fact, most of our customers who've gone, who are going through this journey in transforming their studios from SDI to IP, one of the biggest use cases is resource sharing. So you don't have to build a single production control room for every single studio, right? So you have your studios, you just build one or two production control rooms and just share, right? Because you're not gonna use that studio 24 seven. And that's the reality, right? And this is the, another reason why the industry itself is moving from SDI to IP, or, or the IP adoption is taking place. Do you all agree? You know, these, any other reasons that you can think of why you may want to move to IP? Okay, well, so, if you look at the entire uh, production chain, right, so what happens between video being produced to you and I watching it on TV, so we, it goes to the studios where content is produced, then post-production, that's where a lot of graphics and editing is done. And then it gets distributed through video head ends and then we watch it, right? And, and most of this is already IP. For example, your playout, your distribution networks are already IP. It's just that the production is what is going through this journey. So for the rest of my session, you know, I would be focusing on how do you build infrastructure that's going to enable the production facilities to move from SDI to IP. So that'll be the meat of this presentation. And towards the end, we'll also talk about uh, some use cases that are applicable to other, a, other aspect of video delivery, be it contribution and distribution. So that way you will pretty much cover all of these use cases. Now production facility. I'm assuming everyone's walked into a studio. I walked in, you know, in, in 2016, but what happens as soon as you walk into the studio room, right, you have your cameras and your microphones that's getting content that's being sent somewhere else. So this disruption that I'm talking about, the move from SDI to IP, would apply to several use cases. One is live studio production, be it inside a studio or at a stadium inside an OB truck. Then uh, production control rooms. This is where, again, we'll, we'll, another use case of going from SDI to IP. And then finally, master control infrastructures. So today we have customers who do at least one of all these three as you know, for this STI to IP use case. So everything that we're going to learn today for the next hour would apply for each of these use cases. Now, has an, who's not seen an SDI router? Is anyone in the room not seen an SDI router? Okay. Here we are. So, for you, it just looks like a big box with cables in, coming in and going out, right? So our whole goal with this 
journey is to go replace that SDI router with a flexible IP infrastructure, right? Simple as that. It's not so simple, which is why we are all here talking about this transition. So that's our goal. Now, before, you know, before going into IP, talking about S, you know, 2110 and all that, let's just do a quick recap, right? Because this is something that I learned in my journey. Hey, what exactly happens in a studio, right? What, what is the use of that STI router? So when you go into you know, studio room, you typically have an operator who has these colorful buttons that looks like that panel right there, right? That, so that's like your control panel using which the operator routes certain cameras to certain destinations, right? So when the director says, hey, move from the news anchor to the weather room, someone goes, presses that button, and moves that flow from the camera facing the news anchor to the camera facing the weatherman. Now, in the traditional SDI world, when the control panel is, uh, when the broadcast operator requests a route, that talks to the broadcast controller, right? So broadcast control is an entity, so that that control panel communicates using some proprietary protocol through to the broadcast controller. And the broadcast controller programs this SDI router. So the SDI router is nothing but a cross point. It has a bunch of ins and outs. All that broadcast controller is doing is going and programming the cross point so you can route any source to any destination. And finally, the broadcast controller sets up the path. Right? This is how it Again, you know, there's lots of things happening behind the scene. I've completely abstracted, made it very simple, so you and I understand what's going on behind the scenes. So this is the normal workflow in the SDI environment, in the old, old environment. Now, as this workflow moves from SDI to IP, of course, right, there has to be some standards that define how exactly is video and audio going to be carried in IP. So there is a body called SIMT. I mean, for all the network, network engineers in the room, you're familiar with IEEE and IETF, right? That's so focused on Ethernet. There's also an industry, there's a standards body called SIMT, which stands for Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers that develops standards for television. So they came up with a standard called 2022-6. It was the first standard that basically defined how SDI payload can be carried in an IP. In, in IP. And some of the first studios, like Canal Plus, who went live, they went with you know, this technology, because that was the only technology that was available back then. Very recently, the industry body came up with a new technology called, a new standard called SIMT 2110. So the whole goal of SIMT 2110, I'll just show you in a minute, is to take your audio and video and send it as unique IP streams, right? So, the video becomes one stream, the audio becomes one or many streams, and then you know, your closed captioning, metadata, metadata becomes different streams. So for the network engineers in the room, each of these streams represents a multicast signal, a multicast flow, right? So if you are going to be building an infrastructure that's going to be carrying SMT 2110 traffic, it will have at least, every signal will have at least three multicast flow, one video, one audio, and one ancillary. You could have more than that, just based on how things are set up. But this gives you a picture of what you will be encountering uh, as you build the network, right? This, these are, this is the traffic that you will be carrying in that network. But there's only one caveat to this, right? It's not your traditional you know, multicast flow. The video we're talking about here can be as high as 10.8 gigabits per second. If someone is producing content in 4K, which will be done at the Olympics, each multicast flow can be as high as 10.8 gigabits per second. So these are massive high bandwidth video flows. Right. Most of the customers today operate in 1.5 gig HD or 3 gig HD, so each of these flows are you know, either 1.5 gig or 3 gig. So again, it's not your distribution network or your IPTV where typically the, the flow size is really small. We will be dealing with uncompressed video, which are extremely high bandwidth flows. So remember that, because there will be some challenges that, will that we would need to solve just because of the nature of this traffic. The other standard, just going back to my slide, is 2059-2. We'll talk about that because we need to make sure that all the endpoints are synchronized. They operate in the same time domain, so it defines how exactly you propagate timing to this endpoint. And then finally, 
NMOS or AMVA NMOS, right? Again, at a very high level, these endpoints, remember when the, in the SDI world, when the, when the operator pressed that control panel, the control panel spoke to the broadcast controller, the broadcast controller programmed the SDI router. So in the IP world, there are standards being defined as to how that out-of-band communication will take place. So ISO 4 is a standard using which endpoints, you know, your cameras, your video switchers, your multi-viewers, can register with the broadcast controller and say, hey, I am a Sony camera. I will be transmitting a three gig video, right? So ISO 4 covers this whole concept of registering, telling the central entity who you are and what you're gonna do, okay? ISO 5 is basically, remember, as the operator sets up the route, the broadcast controller goes and programs you know, the fabric. In the IP world, it works a little differently. So ISO 5 is a mechanism using which the broadcast controller can talk back to these endpoints, to the cameras, to the multi-viewers, and, and, you know, and so on. I'll show you in, in, in a slide how exactly that works. And ISO 6 is actually work in progress. It basically defines how the network can communicate with the broadcast controller. Again, don't, don't, again, the intent of bringing up the slides is to just share with you some of the terms that will hit you as you transition through this journey. So just be aware that, hey, when someone tells you ISO 5, it means the broadcast controller is talking to the endpoints and so on. Okay. Now, how does the same routing work in the IP world? So in the IP world, there are three different ways of moving that same traffic from the camera to the monitors or from the camera to the video switchers. And I'm gonna discuss each of these three ways of doing it. In the first way, it's called the IGMP method, okay? Is everyone familiar with IGMP? Or if you do multicast, so for people who are not familiar, multicast where you, you have someone transmitting a signal, the destinations of the receivers, they send an IGMP request to basically say what traffic they want. Right, so it's a, it's a way for receivers or destination to signal to the network what traffic they want to subscribe to. So in the first method, as soon as you plug your cameras, your endpoints, they, of course, register with the broadcast controller using ISO 4, so, they basic, so the broadcast controller knows who's connected, where they're connected, what they're doing, and so on. Now, as the operator routes camera one to the video switcher, the broadcast controller using ISO 5 talks to that destination, which in our case is that video switcher. So this mechanism, this communication happens through an out-of-band channel, and that video switcher uses, an, uses IGMP to tell the network, hey, I no longer want camera one, I want to now switch to camera two. So you see that whole workflow, how that's working? So this is all done through IGMP, right? So the broadcast controller talks to the Switcher, and the switcher uses IGMP to make that request. Most deployments that's gone live so far work in this mode, okay? Now, there are people in the industry who want to also leverage other modes. One is the API mode. In this second mode, rather than, you know, the destination sending the IGMP join and telling the network, hey, I now want to move from camera one to camera two, the broadcast controller actually makes an API call. So we don't use IGMP. The broadcast controller can make an API call and tell the network that they want to switch from camera one to camera two. So the routing is, is still done in the IP fabric, but the way of subscribing to flows is all done through APIs. And last but not the least, this is, this, this is what uh, is called the SDN model, where the network is, is I don't want to call it dumb, but you can call it dumb in the sense it's not intelligent. The network is just made of switches. All of the intelligence is in the, in the broadcast controller, and the broadcast controller talks to every single switch and then says how, do, how, how exactly should a flow be routed from the camera to that destination. So this is, an, this is called the SDN model. So if there's a company called Nevion uh, and Everts. They kind of use this SDN model. There are other companies in the broadcasting space like Labo, E, uh, Grass Valley, Imagine, they, can, they fall into these two categories, Sony and example, right? So again, what does it mean for the network engineers is 
you develop, you, can, you configure the network similarly, you configure it identically, but there will be subtle changes, small changes, we'll talk about it, if you're operating in one mode versus the other. And I often get questions, hey, which mode is better? Is this mode better than this? Is this mode better than that? Uh, I'm sorry? Can we mix? The question is, hey, can we mix these two modes? So typically, you can mix these two modes, where the network is still doing the flow of programming, but the way the request is initiated is either through IGMP or API, so these two can be mixed, but this is truly SDN, right, where the network is not doing anything intelligent, it's all being done through a controller up north. So typically, you either go in this mode or you can go in a combination of these two modes. Question, yes? So the, yeah. So the question from the audience is, hey, this communication from the broadcast controller to this destination, has it, does it always have to be out of band or can it be in band? The answer is it can be both in band and out of band. It's a choice. It's a choice, it's a choice but we recommend people keeping it out, out of band if possible. That's the recommendation. Okay, makes sense. Now, if I have to quickly recap, right, what does all this mean for the network engineer is you're building a fabric that can transport multicast, that can do timing. And we've been transporting multicast for 20 years now. Right, so shouldn't it, shouldn't it be simple? Well, the answer is unfortunately no. There are some unique challenges that you will come across. In fact, those are the challenges we came across as we started this journey, which is unique to these workflows, which is not applicable to majority of these workflows, right? Which is, hey, how do you transition from one technology to another technology, but the operators, right, the broadcast operators in the room, they shouldn't learn this new technology. Because as soon as you tell them, hey, by the way, you cannot press those buttons anymore, you have to do something different, they'll be like, go to hell, I'm not gonna adopt this technology, right? And it happens to me, right? If I have to adopt a technology, it has to be seamless. It, it, should, not, it should not make me, the end user, feel that, hey, this is complex. So one of the goals as we transition from SDI to IP is to make sure that the operators don't see the difference. Right, that's the first challenge. The second challenge is zero packet loss. How many of you all would be okay if you're watching the football World Cup and the screen goes black for a little while, right? I would assume no one. Especially if it's the commercials, the TV channels hate it the most because they don't care. <laughs> it was a joke, right, when I was talking to a a TV provider in, in the US, they say, if the game goes off, it's okay, but commercials should work, because that's how we make our money. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, IP and multicast was always best effort. Hey, you just sent it and prayed it works. There's, there's no mechanism built into multicast where it can retransmit. And it's live, if the packet is lost, it's lost. So how do you build infrastructure that you can guarantee zero packet loss. That's a second challenge or, yeah, second challenge that all of you all will have to solve. Otherwise, you will not be able to go into this new, new transition. Third one is making sure everything is synchronized. Your microphone should be synchronized to your camera, should be synchronized to your switcher, because if they're not, you try mixing audio and video, you know, because again, people forget the audio is coming from the mic, the video is coming from the camera, and then when you mix it, it should all be synchronized to the nanosecond degree. So how do you make sure that they are all in the same time domain? Okay, that's the third challenge. Fourth challenge is fast switching. So again, when you switch from camera one to camera two to camera three, people will get frustrated if it goes from camera one, then goes black screen, camera two goes black screen, right? So it has to seamlessly switch. So you need to have a system that can switch very quickly from one to the other. And then the system should be highly available. Again, you cannot afford the football World Cup to go down, right? It's okay for anything else to happen, but uh, I love my sports, so I'll be pissed if something like that happens. And last but not the least, nobody talks about it, but how do you secure this environment? See, in the SDI router, it was a box. No one could hack it, or no one could go plug in anything there, right? But in IP, no one is stopping me from taking my laptop, connecting it, running a VLC player, and subscribing to some Game of Thrones that's being shot, and I can leak it and make some money, right? 
No one thinks about that. How do you make sure that uh, as you transition to this new infrastructure, you need to secure it? Right? Do you all agree that these are the challenges? It's not just about creating a network that runs multicast, but think of a solution. And this is what we thought about when we went about you know, building a solution for this industry. Again, familiarize yourself with all these names for the network engineers in the room, because you will only be creating the fabric, but things that are going to be plugging into the fabric will be from some of these companies, right? Tektronix, Grass Valley, Snell. Snell is now Grass Valley, Everts. So these are all the endpoint vendors, the broadcast controllers that come that need to work very well with you so you can provide a solution to, the, to your end customers. And I see a few smiles. I'm be curious why you're laughing. <laughs> so, uh, okay. With all this, I know it was, I know I used a little too much time than I wanted to, but this gives you a good idea of what to expect. And it was really important for you to understand all of this, and only then it makes sense why we're doing what we're doing. So let's build you know, the fabric. Now let's talk about how do we build this fabric. Now of course, when you go through this transition, you know, no one's going to go throw away their camera because it's doing SDI. You've invested in your cameras, you've invested in your video switches, and they may all be doing SDI. But maybe you're, when you buy something new, you, make, you buy an IP, you know, a native IP endpoint, you know, like an IP camera or an IP multi-viewer. So for the, for the instruments that use SDI, there are these gateways that can translate from the SDI to IP and vice versa. And these gateways are the ones provided by the Everts, the Lavos, the Grass Valleys of the world. Or the native endpoints can be directly connected to the network because they're IP, right? So most of your endpoints will either be gateways, IP gateways, or native endpoints when you plug into the fabric. Now, deployment options. You could use a single big box because it looks like an SDI router and connect everything there. This is what we see in OB trucks. So if you go into this OB trucks, they like one big box, put everything there because you know, this whole spine leaf doesn't make sense in an OB truck. But most studios, they go with the spine leaf model because it's flexible. Uh, but again, I, I also know studios have gone with a single leaf. It's not like one is better than the other, but just these are the models, deployment options that you have. And finally, we also do something called as hybrid spine leaf. So you can build a spine leaf, but also connect endpoints to the spine, which is unique to this industry, right? I've never seen this happen in the traditional IT deployment because in the IT world, most endpoints are 10 gig or maybe 25 gig. But in this video world, a lot of these multi-viewers and video switches can be 100 gig. And when you need a lot of 100 gig ports, your spine has a lot of you know, 100 gig ports sitting there. You could, if you want to, you can use it. So these are you know, the options that you have uh, you know, to connect these networks. So now, now that you've decided, OK, I'm going to go with single box or spine leaf, let's see what are the building blocks. right? So you build this fabric. You need, to con you need to configure these links as layer three routed links, okay? So the first and foremost, you just need to create the link between the span leaf as layer three routed links. People tell me, hey, why can't I just do layer two everywhere? It's simple. The answer is layer two is scary because what happens if someone starts misbehaving and starts sending some nonsense flood? It's going to go everywhere in that layer two domain. So which is why when you build networks for video delivery, make sure you try to build it layer three only, especially layer three between the leaf and spine. And of course, you, know, you need to enable some kind of unicast routing protocol, like OSPF, ISIS, because that's how multicast works. And then multicast routing, right? End of the day, all of these flows, the SMPTE 2022-6 or 2110, they're all multicast flows. So you would need to enable multicast routing, which in our case is PIM and then IGMP version three. So at the end of the day, pretty much this is what you, the protocols that you would come across as you build this network, right? OSPF, ISIS for unicast routing, PIM for multicast routing. Last but not the least, don't forget QoS. Now, uh, if you want to prioritize your live production traffic over file-based workflows, you need to put them in two different queues. Uh, we'll talk about that in detail as we get to uh, post-production. So those are the building blocks right in this fabric. Now, again, right, traditionally, 
Now you've decided, okay, I need to build a spine leaf fabric. Now traditionally, the way people sold SDI routers, so if you go to Everts and tell them, hey, I want to buy an SDI router, they'll ask you, what matrix? Is this a 512 by 512, 1024 by 1024? What does that mean? It basically means the SDI router has ins and outs. So you can connect 512 in and 512 out, right? And that's how SDI was sold, because SDI is unidirectional, right? It, so it has ins and outs, and you can only carry one signal per wire. Now, you cannot do the same thing in, in the IP world, because all IP interfaces are bidirectional, and a single cable can carry multiple signals. So the way you design or you size your network actually depends on the number of endpoints you have. So let's take an example, right? Um, you know, I say I have, I'm building a new studio. I have, uh, you know, IP gateways that require 36, 40 gig ports. So I have IP gateways from Grass Valley that, like GV nodes. I have IP cameras that requires 10 gig ports, and then I have some audio and intercom that requires 51 gig ports. So these are the requirements, right? So you've got to, you've got to build an infrastructure for these requirements. Unlike traditional IT deployment, where typically the bandwidth going south and the bandwidth going north is always oversubscribed, which means that if you have 48 ports of 10 gig going south, your uplinks are usually less than that, right? It's always like one is to four oversubscribed because in the IT world, it's not like everyone is talking to everyone throughout the day, right? It's, it's, you know, it's okay for the network to be oversubscribed because we know from all these years of experience that not everyone is talking to everyone at the exact same time. Now, don't ever, when you go talk to your broadcast team, don't ever tell them I'm going to build oversubscribed networks. They'll tell you, get out of the room. Because broadcasters want non-blocking network. If you tell them anything else, they will not listen to you, right? And, and these are your peers, right? Your, your partners that typically who are from the media team. They always want a fabric that's non-blocking, which means whatever bandwidth is going south, that should be same as the bandwidth going north. So it should be at least one is to one oversubscribe. You cannot build oversubscribe fabric for this deployment. All right, is this clear? And if you do the math, you know, this will come up to, hey, by the way, I'm going to have a bunch of Nexus 9Ks that have 40 gig ports, 10 gig ports, and eventually you can build. You know, then you, with that math in, in mind, you can build a network that looks something like this, right? In this case, I'm doing a spine and leaf. So you see how we've been able to take the requirements and using this logic of making sure that the uplink to downlink is not oversubscribed, you build a fabric. So that's something to always keep in mind non oversubscribed networks as you transition to IP. Have a question? Uh, in my scenario, we plan the uplink capacity to be the double of the stream that we are pushing. So you can do link switching and we guarantee that the receiver can subscribe to both of the, uh, of the streams and then you have a link switching. Okay. So the comment, uh, you know, here from my friend was that, hey, in his deployment that they went live SIC, they've gone with double the bandwidth, right? So if, if, if you require, say, 50 gig south, they've gone with 100 gig north. Because you, know, it, you have more bandwidth to do some things like clean switching. We'll talk about that you know, as we go through our slides. But yeah, again, as long as the bandwidth north is more, I'm saying at the minimum, it should be the same. But if you can do it more, even better. There'll be more optics that Cisco can sell you. We make more money. We make more switches. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So there is, now you've built your network, right? You've built all of this network. You start routing your traffic. Uh, OK, I'll start enabling the PIM. Your, your operators start requesting for signals. So let's assume that you have 40 gig links, right? So I have 40 gig, 40 gig, 40 gig, so 120 gig. And I have each stream is 12 gig. So theoretically, I have a non-blocking network, correct? Because I have 12 times 4, right? But I have. 40 times 3. So I'm good. I have a non-blocking fabric, so everything should work. But let's take a scenario, right? So someone makes a request. OK, the network sets up this flow. So the audio goes on link 3. The video goes on link 1. All good. One more flow is set up. A receiver, another receiver comes online and subscribes to a new flow. But this time, hey, the video took the same uplink you know, that the previous video did. Again, you cannot control this, right? This is how protocols work. If it finds multiple paths 
from source to destination, it's going to randomly pick one path, and that's how protocols work. So what happens as you start routing all these signals, boom, you have oversubscribed that link. See, that math, all that planning we did and said, hey, we have sufficient bandwidth, no problem, all, everything we had routed, but people forget it's all probability. It just depends on how your traffic hashes. So if your hashing, your load balancing is not correct, even though theoretically you have enough bandwidth, you could run into a situation where all of your high bandwidth videos ended up on the same link, oversubscribing the link. So there is a need for intelligent multicast, right? So there is, an, there is a, some kind of intelligence needs to be added to multicast to prevent the scenario. And this is what gave, you know, uh, this, is, this is what gave rise to Cisco's NBM, or non-blocking multicast. So Cisco's non-blocking multicast simply brings bandwidth awareness to PIM. So rather than using this randomness and just picking one, one of the several available path, what if we chose, always chose the least utilized path? Say I had three ways to pull the traffic. I always go to my least utilized way. Then I'm always making sure that I'm evenly distributing the load. And this is what we did with NBM. So the same workflow, if I had NBM enabled, it looks something like this. You see what's happening to the utilization? You get, you're getting a much cleaner traffic distribution. So what we've done is we have added bandwidth awareness to PIM using this process called NBM. So you, you no longer, you're assured that you will not be oversubscribing the network. Okay. And not only that, we, I'll just go to one slide. We can also do things like monitoring the bandwidth or utilization on the endpoint. Now, see, the, you could have a monitor, a multi-viewer or a video switcher that's connected using 10 gig as an example. Let's say it has already joined three gigs, three, three gig streams, so it's already joined nine gigs, right? If someone makes a mistake and tries to subscribe for more traffic, if that was allowed, you're, just, you're also going to oversubscribe this link. So we've also extended endpoint protection. So if something like this happened where the link to that destination is already full, we can deny that, we can gracefully say, hey, sorry, you're trying to request for something, but you don't have enough bandwidth. We've already, it's already filled with some, some of the traffic, so we automatically protect uh, your network from some things like this. So you see, it's, it's, we've come up with this logic of make, making sure that at any given point in time, your network remains non-blocking and non-oversubscribed. So this, again, I'll just go back one slide. This is what NBM does, right? So Cisco's NBM, which operates on the Nexus 9K, brings bandwidth awareness to multicast routing at a very high level. And there are two modes of NBM. One is the active mode, where Cisco is, remember that slide I told you, the three, three ways of making routes, the IGMP way, the API way, and then the uh, SDN way. So NBM can work in active mode, which is Cisco taking care of making sure that the networks remain oversubscribed. But you can also put NBM in passive mode. So this is in the passive mode, the network, the switch is not intelligent. We expose APIs using which an external controller can you know, route signals, like Nevion and Ewert's Magnum of the world. Let me pause you and ask you, is this clear? Does anyone have any questions? So again, it's important to make sure that you just simply don't throw bandwidth at the problem because that's not solving it. Make sure you have a process that can assure you that you always load balance efficiently in your network. You have a question? Yeah. Is the link divisible? So can I see what the next link, so how NBM is making that decision, what the next link is going to use? Is that information available? available? All right. The question was, uh, is that information, how do I know, for example, let's say everything is working, the next time someone makes a request, what link would NBM use? The answer is yes. It's available through CLIs and, and through DCNM, where you can look at how much of the links are utilized, and next time you make a request, which link would be used. So that information is possible. Yes? Does it work in a people mode, or uh, can you decide which? OK. So the question uh, they have is, hey, when NBM does load balancing, does it work in a FIFO or round robin? In a way, it does work in round robin, but we've also made it smart. For example, if, uh, 
that because again, it's multicast, right? If there's traffic that's already pulled because there was some other receiver who requested it, we don't set up a new path. We kind of reuse you know, some of that path because the flow is already there. So there's a little much more intelligent than just going blindly going flea -fo. You know, we've added to the logic. So a collection of, last question. Um, where is the out of band network? So the, let me go up. So the question is where is the out of band network? I haven't shown it in the diagram, but uh, typically, Typically, uh, let me see. Yeah, there would be a separate network, you know, uh, built using a different infrastructure through which any kind of out of band signaling goes through. I don't have a slide on that, but so most of this is in band that I've shown, but you will also have an out of band where these switches can be managed and controllers can talk to each other and so on. All right, so uh, Cisco's IP fabric for media. Now I'm getting into the solution. So. If you see, of all, the, the whole goal of doing it this way, so you understand the problem, you understand the challenges, and how we, we are solving it, right? And that's the reason why I put all this information in that order. So Cisco's IP fabric for media has this Nexus 9K running NBM, but we've also added another component to it called DCNM, Cisco's Data Center Network Manager. And the role DCNM plays is to give you this visibility of how my flows are traversing the network, what exactly, you know, uh, because end of the day, one of the things that, you know, broadcasters were very scared was, hey, in the SDI world, I knew this link carried my video, something bad happened, I just go remove this link, put another link, because it was only one signal per link. In the IP world, I don't know, it's, it's a fabric, you have multiple links going on all over your uh, facility, how do I trace? what path the given signal is flowing, right? So we've added a lot of intelligence to show you that. And the way we do that is leveraging telemetry. So in the old model of monitoring network, you periodically go to the network and say, hey, how are you doing? And the network says, I'm doing fine. Okay, five more minutes later, you go, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Something goes bad, you won't realize it. Next time I go and ask the network, hey, how are you doing? You'll say, yeah, something's not good, right? So you see it's not real time. So the industry itself is changing, going, going away from that polling model into this push model called telemetry. So every single switch is configured to do telemetry, streaming telemetry, where it can stream its real time state to the controller, which is DCNM. And as a result, as soon as you set up these, as soon as operators are routing different flows in the network, we can show you how exactly these flows are routed in real time, right? So we can do things like topology discovery. This is actually my QA lab. You know, when Cisco validates a solution, we actually validate it in our labs with, with scale. It's not something we guess and say it works. So this, is a, this is a topology for my QA labs. There's two spines, 48 leaves. Uh, we can discover all the endpoints which is pretty cool. So as soon as you plug in that Sony camera, the Grass Valley switcher, you can visualize all of that on DCNM. And you can actually visualize how multicast flows are traversing the network. So I'll give you a sm small demo uh, after these slides so we can actually see it work. So you can actually visualize the end-to-end -end path of every single multicast flow in your fabric. Isn't that cool? You never had this, you know, and multicast troubleshooting can be a bit of a, pain. I come from TAC. I used to troubleshoot for six years of my life, and multicast was kind of complex. So we've developed tools so that you, the end user, can visualize what's going on in the network just to make your life a little easy. Right? And I'll, again, don't worry about it. I'll come back. When I do the quick demo, you'll see all of this work in a real setup. All right, security. I had someone from the cybersecurity team in the room. It's often not, sometimes people forget to even think about security, right? They're so worried about making sure that streams work. But it's important to pay attention to security. So how do you secure this fabric? So first and foremost, what we've done is we've, we are, you're able to create this fabric in what we call as whitelist model, where by default, everyone is denied. And then you can granularly say, hey, you are an authorized endpoint, I allow you, right? So this is possible in our solution, where you can granularly allow who can participate in the fabric. 
Second one is flow authorization. So you can not only say, okay, you know what, this flow can only be routed to these destinations. If some other destination or receiver is requesting for this flow, we will not allow. And, and, and if, while this was one use case, you know, it's not production really, but I had a customer who, I think they were building a video head end. You know, they had kids channel and RL channel, right? And they didn't want even accidentally for the RL channel to get routed in the kids network. And so you can add such protection in the network where you can eventually say, hey, by the way, this destination can only subscribe to these sources. Even accidentally someone tries to route traffic, we will be denied. You see, think of all these problems because it might, you might go three years without encountering this problem and one disastrous things happen and you know, you'll be up one week answering several hundred emails and you'll be questioned, hey, why did you think about it? It, al it always happens. Uh, and then uh, finally, flow policing. So remember, you build the network with an assumption that this camera is only going to send three gig. What if the camera accidentally sends 10 gig? All that math you had in place just goes down the, down, you know, you, it's, not, it's no longer predictable. So what we do is we automatically program policer. So as soon as you say, hey, this camera can only send three gig, we go and enforce that in our switch. So if the camera starts sending more than three gig, we police it. So all of, that, all of this is done automatically. It's not like you need to create your own QoS policies, you need to create these policers manually. It's all run to alt automation with our solution. And finally, we can do a real-time monitoring, right? So you have 2110, which has audio, video, and ancillary. We can go and measure the bit rate of every single flow. So you can actually go, I'll show you this in the demo, you can actually figure out, hey, is my camera actually sending 1.5 gig of traffic and so on? Can, what, is, what does this mean to you all is that you have sufficient information to figure out what's going on in your network. Some of these things that we simply lacked all these years. All right, I've spoken about all this. Uh, I'll show you the demo, which is why I'm skipping slides, right? So all in all, again, if you decide to take up this journey and decide to build uh, IP fabric, hopefully you go with Cisco. But again, I'm not a sales engineer. I'm, I'm a part of your team. What the, some of the questions you need to be asking your network vendor, be it Cisco or anyone else, is, hey, can you assure that your fabric is non-blocking? Can you assure that you will give me enough information so I can troubleshoot my network easily? Can you assure that this entire fabric is secure? Can you assure that it is highly available? So these are some of the questions that you need to be asking your network vendor and see what is it that they have to offer. Because these are the, some of the questions. If I put myself in your shoes, these are the things that I would be worried about. And which is why we really thought of this as a solution. We built all of it into our IP fabric for media. Makes sense, any comments, questions? Yes, good. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree that it, it has to be a broken uh, network, but there is a paradigm that the network has to be one. Yes. And you have a company with a networking that is uh, cooperative and technical. You have to deploy another isolated networking network. for that. I, this is a direct uh, oh. uh, a question I suppose that is yes. Hold on to that. It's a very, very good question. The question the gentleman asked is, hey, by the way, a lot of people are building purpose-built fabric, right? Today, the trend is you build this IP fabric for production. You build an IP fabric for data center. You build an IP fabric for your, um, for your office. You build an IP fabric for contribution. Will there be a time when you can combine all of these together? I'll get, back, I'll get to that because that's, that'll, that's a valid question that I come. Uh, so just hold on to that thought. Have we another question? Let me go back so I get recorded on the screen. So the question is, uh, hey, if I'm gonna be building IP fabric for uncompressed media, I should not be using ACI? Well, the answer is more or less correct. Any overlay technology, be it VXLAN, which ACI uses under the hood, it's not optimized for uncompressed video delivery. It's okay if it's all compressed workflows, video head ends, IPTV, small bit streams, ACI works fine, VXLAN TRM works fine, but uncompressed, there are a few challenges that we haven't solved because it's not bandwidth aware. Remember this whole making sure that, hey, you load balance based on bandwidth, that element is missing in fabrics like any overlay technology. So that's the reason why 
Maybe in a few months, I'll have a better answer. And last but not the least, this is how everything will come together, right? You will pick a network. Hopefully, again, it's Cisco. We are the best in the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can go with one of the broadcast controllers. Right. So this is, these are the most common ones. Of course, these are not the only ones. There are a variety of them out there. But from my experience, most of my customers have gone with one of the above. And finally, let's go to deployment architectures so that we've learned all of this together. Um, how do you make this hitless? Um, remember I told you that I don't even want a single packet drop when I'm watching that soccer game? The only true way of making this entire solution hitless is to build two fabrics, right? And this is how things, were, things would happen in the SDI world as well. Even in the SDI world, people had two SDI routers. They called it the red and the blue. Uh, I don't know, if, any other terms? I only know the red and the blue, or the primary and the backup. Maybe I'm just making that up. So they went with, even they do this in SAN, right? In storage area network, they have a SAN A and SAN B. Because any application that requires absolutely zero packet loss, the way to solve it is by building redundant networks. And what happens is these cameras, right, that's generating the video, it sends two copies. It sends one copy along the primary network, one copy along the backup network. And both those copies goes to the receiver. So if I'm the receiver, like the monitor, I get the primary copy, I get the backup copy. So all of these uh, packets use this protocol called RTP, right? It uses UDP or RTP, and, and they have something called a sequence numbers. So what they do is, as they get two copies of the packet, they know these are duplicate copies, so it, it discards one of the copy. So if something bad would happen, for example, the spine goes down or this link fails, you know, networks take maybe one second to converge, but one second is, is too bad for video, right? Because that one second of outage is visible for you and I. You see black and we, So to prevent that, the backup copy would go through this backup network. So at any given point in time, you're getting two copies. So something bad would happen to the primary copy, the receiver gets that backup copy. So this implementation is called SIMT 2022-7. Every deployment that has gone live so far have gone with two, two, two fabrics. Now, there are ways to combine these two into a single fabric, but that's outside the scope of this session. Maybe if you visit us at NAB or IBC, we can talk more. But today, we recommend building two fabrics, especially for you know, live production, where you want to guarantee that you see zero packet loss. Again, all those, you would, you, would you would enable NBM here, NBM here. You know, it's exactly configured identically. Of course, you know, the more network switches that get sold as a result, I mean, it's, it's not us pushing it, but it's the architecture, right? Any questions with Dash 7? Thoughts? All right. All right, the other use case, this is an actual use case from our customer in New York. You know, they were tired of paying you know, they were renting studios and production control rooms in New York City, in Manhattan, you know, paying humongous rent, but that studio was only used for four hours every week, right? So the biggest problem with SDI is you build a studio, you build a production control room, and it was dedicated resource. It's not like tomorrow if, some other sh if you want to shoot a different show, you could just go walk into that studio because that studio's purpose built for a certain show. The biggest advantage of IP is resource sharing. So now you could have 20, 30, 50 studios, which is in the case of SIC, Canal Plus, so multiple studios, but common production control rooms, right? And the biggest benefit is, hey, I walk in, you know, there's a show at 2 o'clock today. The entire crew walks in, the operators, the director. The entire studio is set up for show one. Show one is over. You can immediately repurpose that entire production room for show number two. You see, that's the beauty about IP, is to enable these workflows like data sharing. So this customer now just has two production control rooms for all their servers, right? So it's an optimized use of resources and cost saving as well. So this is the most popular use case of IP, is uh, distributed studios and resource sharing. Remote production, one of my favorite use cases. Again, IP makes remote production so easy. 
our customers, one of our first customers in, in Europe, uh, TV2 in Norway. It's a great story. They have their main facility, the production facility, I think in Oslo, but they have studios distributed everywhere else in the country, and they don't send the entire crew there. They just route uncompressed video over their dedicated WAN fibers, they bring it to the central facility and they produce right there. So you save money because you don't have to ship a crew every time. And then that's the beauty about IP. All you need is a single 100 gig cable or a 40 gig cable and you can transport uncompressed over this infrastructure. So remote production becomes another use case that you can benefit as you transition from SDI to IP. And then multi-site. So what does multi-site really mean? Is uh, Again, I'm going to point to our customers in the audience. You're not going to have one facility in one building and you're done, right? Pretty much if you walk into a campus, you have, within that facility, you have different buildings, maybe different geographical locations, like you know, our customer in the US, they have facility in Europe, sorry, in Vegas, in Boston, in LA, in New York. You can actually interconnect all of them and have this uncompressed video transported between them and still, still be able to do things like NBM. So we can also manage bandwidth on these WAN links. So imagine, right, you're building an infrastructure that can not only guarantee bandwidth awareness within the DC, but even across DCs. So it's possible. Right? OK, so we've spoken so much about multicast and transport. Uh, let me pause here right now. Uh, any questions, comments on the last section? All good, clear? So it's. Now, the final piece to the puzzle is timing, and this is what kept me up at night when we started this project, but it's, it's significantly improved uh, over these years. Now, in the SDI world, also we use timing, right? So it is very, very important for all your endpoints to be time synchronized, and the way they did that in the traditional SDI world was to use, you know, like a master sync generator, send one PPS, and everyone were in the same domain. Because like I was telling you that problem, right? You're producing audio, you're producing video, you need to make sure it's all synchronized to that nanosecond level. So as you combine them, it all works good. Now in the IP world, we're going to leverage a new protocol called Precision Time Protocol, PTP. PTP would be used now to distribute timing instead of that one PPS. Now PTP is not new. PTP has been used in the industry over several years. The financials used it, the service providers used it. You know, these, if you go to the assembly line where they make cars, you see all these robots, they're completely time synchronized. That's, again, use of PTP, right? Anything that requires such precision where, you know, at this point in time, you need to do this, you need to take this action. The only way to do that through Ethernet is PTP because we can assure time synchronization to the nanosecond level, right? That's, and the media requires the endpoints to be synchronized within one micro. So the maximum that they can be, off, the offset between, say, the switcher and the camera could be within plus or minus 500 nanoseconds. It's that aggressive. So, which is why the industry came up with PTP. Again, I'm not going to go in details with PTP. At a very high level, when you configure PTP on your network switches, there are two modes that you can operate in. One is called the PTP transparent mode. The other one is called PTP boundary mode. Uh, Cisco supports boundary clock on the Nexus 9K. We don't support transparent clock uh, because we never really saw a strong use case for it. Uh, the idea here in the boundary clock mode is that, uh, are, you, are you familiar with grandmasters like Tektronics? A couple of hands. So there's this time source, right? So there's an entity that is responsible to be that master clock, master clock reference in your plant. It's typically a, a, G, uh, a grandmaster from Mindberg, Tektronix, Ewerts, they make it. That becomes your PTP master. And then one of the switch, the switch that's directly connected to that grandmaster becomes the master for the network. And everything else that's connected to it becomes its slave. And that level becomes the master for everything else that's connected to it. And you see this master slave, master slave. So that's so which is that's that's how boundary clocks work, right? Every switch would be master in one direction and slave in the other direction at a very high level. The advantage of going with this master and slave mode by using boundary clock is you can build a highly scalable fabric. With transparent clock, the problem was all of your endpoints, right? Your video switcher, your uh, 
uh, multi-viewers, they spoke directly to the grandmaster. They spoke directly to the Tektronix and Mindberg, right? And they can only have certain scale. They say, hey, I can only do 1,000 or 100 endpoints. I can't do more than that. But your facility might have 1,000 devices. So the only way to build a scalable distribution of timing is through boundary clock. And that's why all our customers have gone with boundary clock mode. And then there are you know, uh, profiles. It's called AS67 that's used for audio, SIMT 2059-2 for video. Again, just remember all of this, because as you're going to be implementing PTP in your network, you will configure the box to do a certain profile based on whether you're building an audio, audio facility or a video facility running 2110 and so on. Last but not the least, uh, I forgot about this architecture, right? Now, of course, most, see, when you talk about 2022-7 deployment, you have Fabric A and Fabric B. But you have to make sure that the end, because the endpoints, the video switcher is common, right? It's just one switcher that's connected to both Fabric A and Fabric B. They require to see the same grandmaster on both the fabrics. So what you do is you connect the grandmaster through this. If it's a big facility, we, we create something called as a PTP feeder switch. And then these switches can feed PTP to both the networks. So this is one deployment option, is connect the grandmaster to like a layer that's only doing PTP and feed that to all your networks, right? The second approach is you get rid of the PTP, you can directly extend timing between the two networks, but be careful. Do not extend video and audio, only extend timing between these two networks. So you typically don't want to extend video and audio between these networks, because these are meant to be two isolated networks in Dash 7 mode, but PTP or timing can be the only common parameter. And when you do multi-site or you're doing remote production, people ask me, hey, can I do PTP over WAN? Does anyone have that use case? Remote? Kind of, right? A couple of hands goes up. The biggest challenge, yeah, the biggest challenge with doing PTP over wide area networks like WAN is that your WAN link, they do not offer consistent latency, right? The latency keeps changing. There's a lot of jitter in the WAN link. That's typically how WAN links are. And while PTP can autocorrect, you know, there's mechanisms built into PTP to take this jitter into consideration, the media industry requires very, very aggressive offset, right? Remember I told you this whole variant should be within plus or minus 500 nanoseconds. So sometimes when you try to do PTP over WAN, this offset can be maybe go to like two, three microseconds, which could, which could impact your application which is why a lot of customers, they don't necessarily extend PTP over WAN links. Instead, they have a separate grandmaster in the data center, separate grandmaster in the other, other side, remote production. All of them are locked to the same source, which is GPS, they get, and that's how you do PTP in a wide area network. But if you have dedicated links that you can guarantee that it has fixed, fixed latency, there's nothing preventing you from extending PTP over the LAN links, but Almost all of my customers that have gone live so far, they have separate you know, PTP sources in different networks. And troubleshooting PTP on the Nexus, you know, we have some pretty cool commands, show PTP brief, show PTP clock. You see, we've added a lot of emphasis on making sure that you know how PTP is working on your network. And finally, we also can monitor, remember the DCNM I was telling you about showing you the multicast flows? You can also use the same DCNM to monitor how well is PTP working? And as a part of my demo, I'll also show you that. All right, so thus, any further comments, questions on timing? I know, uh, yes, I'll just come to you one minute, yes? You have a question? So the question is, uh, hey, are there any tools out there that's, that helps troubleshoot PTP? Yes, DCNM can be one tool that can be used to troubleshoot PTP in the network. But uh, the, some of the broadcast controllers, like Lavo VSM has Smart. Uh, they can monitor the PTP on the network as well as on the endpoints. So they can give you a complete picture. We can only do it on the network. The other tools that I'm aware of, like Data Miner from Skyline, I know it's pretty popular among some of our customers. They can do 
pay TV monitoring on the network as well as endpoints. So there are several tools that can give you uh, visibility to how timing is working on the network. You had a question? Oh, yeah. So the question is, are there real cases where we have multiple sites and different isolated grandmasters? The answer is yes. But the use cases that I'm aware of, aware of is production. Now, could there be contribution and other use cases? I honestly am not aware of. But I can try finding out with my sales team if they know any of the customers that they're doing it. All right. So all in all, if I look at Remember the very first, not the first slide, but in the beginning I told you all those challenges that you and I need to solve. Let's ask ourselves, have we met that, right? So the first challenge was unchanged operator workforce. See, with that integration that we, we have with the broadcast control and the network, you, the operators can still use their control panels, their you know, consoles, so none of that changes, but we can still transition over to IP without the end users reflect without the end users realizing that everything is happening in IP in the background. And today, a lot of people, I mean, show of hands, I know Canal Plus and SIC, your operators still operate the way they used to do in the STI world, I would assume, right? Same button, same answer, same yeah. All right. You have an actual user, not me, just me telling you that. Next is deterministic network. I told you, right, how do you make networks bandwidth aware? We did that using NBM. NBM active mode, NBM passive mode. So now we've built this entire network with the assurance that there will be no oversubscription. There will be very good load balancing of traffic. So that's another challenge that we answered. PTP, of course, we now can efficiently distribute timing through PTP and make sure that every single endpoint is synchronized at the nanosecond level. We made the system highly available. So very, very unlikely you will have an outage during a high profile game because we have two paths, there's always two copies being sent, uh, and that's how you build architectures that can guarantee that it will be online 24-7. And last but not the least, security. At least, I'm not saying we've completely secured the network, but leveraging some policies that we've built into our solution, we can enforce who can talk to whom, who cannot talk to whom, and so on. So pretty much all of these challenges is something that we solved with Cisco's IP Fabric from Media. All right, now this brings me to the next topic, right, which is now that we have everything working, I think this is a good time to switch to demo. So we've built this infrastructure, we've got it to work. How do you operate it? How do you, when, when you operate it, the network team goes and looks at the health of the network, how do they know everything is working fine? So rather than using slides, um, you know, I'll, I'll switch to the demo. All right, let me just do uh, cable. OK, perfect. So to, to, this demo involves a remote production use case. So I have a, st a stadium, and I have an IP gateway. Remember those devices that convert STI to IP? So I have an actual IP gateway in the stadium. And I'm going to do remote production, so I'm going to transport all this multicast flows to my data center, and I'll encode it. OK, first and foremost, let's take a look at, I've set this network, everything is working. How can I visualize what's happening in the network? So I'm going to go log into my DCNM. It's a little slow because of the internet. Uh, so, so that's, it's a real, World use case. Yeah, I haven't licensed my DCNM. You know. All right, all right, stop complaining. <laughs> you guys do that, right? <laughs> the good thing is, no one from sales is here. Oh my, I see Benjamin. So, only one sales guy in the room. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I have my data center. So, this is, how, this is my data center. So, you see, it's showing, me, it's showing me the actual fabric, the Nexus 9K, how it's connected, the spine and the leaves, all my endpoints. And I have another, I have a multi, this is a brand new DCNM, it can do multi-fabric, so I can also visualize the stadium. So my stadium in Los Angeles, 
I have a single switch, and I have that IPG, you know, that, that device that's I actually, that's a Nevion box there, right? I have a <laughs> Nevion gateway that's converting from SDI to IP and sending a 2110 stream. So let's, let's start in the stadium and take a look at what's, what stream is Nevion sending. So I just double click this. Oh, actually, I forgot to say prayer to the demo gods. So let's take a minute and say a quick prayer, and hopefully demo works fine. Don't embarrass me. All right, let's, uh, let's do this, actually. Yeah. I have this flow, you see? This multicast signal called, I can even name it. It's actually, this is that video traffic, SMT 2110 video traffic that's being sent from the IPG to my network, and it's going to my data center. See, first and foremost, now I have confirmation that, hey, everything looks good in the stadium. The traffic is passing through that stadium switch and going to my data center. Now I go to the data center and do the same thing. I go to my data center, and I check that same signal, 239.20.13.4. What was it? I forgot. The, oh, yeah, right here. You see, it's. Let me expand it a little. It identifies this as remote. It says the cool thing about DCNM is it can, def, it can detect that this is actually a remote source. It's not physically in the data center, but it's coming from WAN. It's that Nevion IPG. And it's actually being sent to an encoder. See, this is what. We want to prove to the industry that IP can need not be black box, right? It can actually show you in real time how flows are being routed in the network. And we do this using telemetry again. All the switches are constantly streaming their routing table to DCNM, and we're all putting this together. And I can look at other flows as well. So if I click on, I have a bunch of multicast flows, so I click on a different flow. You see? It says, hey, this flow is coming from that it's a, I have a Lava C100 card. It's streaming 2110 video. It's actually going to a Lava multi-viewer and an encoder. And that's the path it's taking in my network. Again, remember, right, when you troubleshoot multicast, rather than going to every single switch and doing show IP, MRoute, show IP, IGMP, snooping, blah, 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 you can quickly visualize how it's being routed in the network. Good question? Very good question. I was hoping someone would ask me. You see, DCNM has discovered the LAVO C100 modules, these multi-viewers. How did that discovery happen? Did it ha happen through that ISO 4, ISO 5? The answer is no. Uh, today, as soon as you plug in that multi-viewer or you plug in that uh, uh, IP gateway, it typically sends an op request in IP world right to its gateway, or it starts transmitting sub-signals. We detect the IP address from the first packet we get. And as soon as this Nexus 9K gets the first packet from that device, it sends, again, through telemetry, it informs DCNM, hey, by the way, I discovered someone new. And we populate that. And then you can ask me, hey, what about, how did we come up with those names, right? So we have this concept called alias. So if I go to media controller and create a host alias, I can actually, for every IP address, I can create a logical name. Again, your operators need not look at IPs. They can look at the logical name. And that's how it shows up there. So it's not NMOS as such, but we discover it through actual traffic. But maybe we can evaluate even looking at NMOS. So the good thing is you can create a logical name for the endpoint, just like how I did. You can also create a logical name for a flow. See, I, I mean, instead of you carrying an Excel sheet and saying, oh, what is 239.111? Oh, it's channel one audio. Look, I have created a logical name for every single multicast flow. So it becomes very easy for your operators to know what this traffic is without referencing a separate smart sheet. You had a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in our scenario, uh, the C100 modules talk LLDP with the switches. Is it possible to make it somehow automatic discovery? Yes. The question is, in uh, their deployment, the C100 modules or some endpoints also enable LLDP. Uh, today, we don't discover through DCNM via LLDP, but I don't see technically it is possible. So we'll definitely consider that as a feedback 
and look at LLDP. Because it wasn't very popular when we started investigating. Not a, not, not a lot of these endpoints did LLDP then. Another question? I'll just come to you in a minute. Yes. In what you showed before with the flow, that was basically just the ITMP sessions, right? So the question is, hey, the visualization that I showed, what exactly was that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a combination of IGMP making the request and PIM setting up the path. And it's actually showing how the data, right, the actual camera feed is traversing that network end to end. Okay. So it's. You can't see the parameters, uh, usage statics, statistics, uh, data loss. Loss. Very good question. Can you see additional parameters of that signal, like the latency, the jitter, the quality? We can do some of it, and I'll show you what we do. Another question? <clears throat> Very good question. Hey, how big can you scale the system? Is there any limitation on the size and the number of flows? So today, we support up to 48 switches in the fabric and up to 32,000 flows. 32,000 flows. Yeah, it should be sufficient, I would assume. <laughs> now, actually, some, some customers are closing. Again, remember, it's simply 2110. One signal could be one audio, and it could be as many as 16, so one video and as many as 16 audios. So if you have a facility with 2,000 channels, so that's 2,000 times 16, so you're almost hitting that 32,000 mark. And imagine if customers are building bigger facilities, you could exceed that. No one's there yet. In theory, we can go up to 96,000, but we are at 32,000 right now. If the industry comes up with use cases, we can... 32,000, yes. All right, the gentleman had a question on stats, so let's go to stats. So I can go to flow status, and that same flow coming from that Nevion IPG, I'm doing 1.5 gig HD, right? I'm doing 1080i. So let's look at the bitrate of that flow. All right, look, it's 1.3. We can actually measure the real-time bitrate of every single flow in the fabric. And again, we can do this for all flows, including audio, video, and metadata. So now you know this camera, even without anyone telling me, I know that IPG is configured to do 1.5 gig HD. Right? So, yes, question. So the question is, hey, is this data available outside of DCNM? The answer is yes. Anything I do in the GUI, there is an API that we expose. For example, today we've integrated with Lavo Smart and Grass, uh, yeah, Lavo Smart specifically that can get this data and visualize it. Even Evert's Magnum can get this data and visualize it. So our, our whole goal is not that you, know, you always need to go to DCNM for everything. Uh, as we work with our partners, like the Lavos, the Nevions, the Everts of the world, we want to expose all this information directly to the broadcast controller so you're, you, don't, you just have to go to one place to visualize the endpoints, the flows, right there. So that's our goal. Of course, it will take some time. But yes, today everything is exposed and available for you to consume. Any other questions? Good. So flow stats. So how are we measuring this, right? So. A single interface can have multiple flows, right? We can actually measure the bitrate of each individual flows, and the way we do that is using policers. Because we program a policer, remember I told you to protect, to protect that system from misbehaving endpoints? And the policer, good thing is it also gives us statistics. And that's how we know what the statistics are. All right. So uh, I go back to the topology before going to that next. And we do things like, hey, I click on the link. It tells me it's a 100 gig link. It tells me I have 95 gig and I only have a few flows, right? See, you get the real-time utilization of your network. So you can confidently know that tomorrow, if someone comes and makes 100 routes, it will work because there's sufficient bandwidth. So we can inform you how much bandwidth is utilized in the network. We can inform you what flows are on that link. You see? It tells you every single flow that's on that link. We can inform you, for example, let's say that you know, you want to do a maintenance window. You want to reload the spine. 
I can tell you what are the flows on that spine. So you can, you see, all of this is possible through telemetry, right? Every, every single switch is telling DCNM what it, what it is doing. So we are just consolidating all of that information and showing it to you in a way. So you know if you're going to be doing some kind of maintenance on spine two, those are the flows that will be impacted. So this is real-time visibility to what's going on in the network through telemetry. All right, and last but not the least, you know, a feature that I'm extremely proud of. Uh, it's called RTP flow monitoring. So remember, I'll, I'll just bring up the slide again. I have this flow from the stadium through a service provider to my facility. One of the biggest complaints I've had my customers make is that, hey, we see bad video on screen in our facility. I call the service provider, and the service provider says, not my problem. Anybody encountered that? Uh, so you have this remote production use case, right? So you have your stadium, you have a service provider. I don't know who the service providers are in Europe, but in, in, in US it's like AT&T, Verizon. They provide dark fibers. And then everything is working fine, and suddenly you see bad video. Then you call your service provider, the first response you'll get is, it's not my problem. Everything is good. Now, how do you know if the problem is at the stadium? on the service provider or your own network. And again, I come from TAC. Even sometimes narrowing down where the problem is takes hours and hours of troubleshooting. You just spend scratching your head doing packet captures, and finally you figure out, oh, it's this switch. Once you, once you figure out where the problem is, it's quite easy to solve it. But narrowing down what's the problem takes the longest time in troubleshooting. So what we've been able to do with our ASICs is we can go deep into the packet, look at the RTP sequence number. Remember, all these flows are RTP flows. And we can detect if there are missing packets on every single flow. So do that. I will simulate a fault, OK? I'm going to go to DCNM. You know, this, I have this feature called RTP flow monitor. So it is monitoring. Uh, let's just go to DC. So it is monitoring that flow, you know, coming from the stadium, 239, 2013. And I go to packet drop. It says, OK, there are no drops. So I'm going to inject errors, and I'm going to inject errors on the Nevion IPG itself. OK? So let's see what that looks like. So I'm just going to quickly, I have a script that I just quickly run to IPG. OK, what has happened as I did that is I have gone and injected errors on that IPG. So the error is on this device itself, which means both this Nexus 9K and these Nexus 9K should report loss, right? Because the error is happening even before it hits the Nexus. So I go. I go to my stadium. Let me look at packet drop. Hey, here you go. You see packet drop? It's actually reporting. I'm seeing some drop. I click on it. And it's immediately saying, you know what? I'm losing packets for this flow. Now imagine how much time this would have taken if you didn't have this hardware telemetry. It would have taken you hours. You didn't even know if it's a problem with that IPG. And a lot of customers have found this extremely useful. Right? And of course, if I go to the state, if I go to the data center, you know, I would expect you know, those devices to also see, yeah, you see, they're reporting loss. It says, yeah, I'm seeing loss. So that's the beauty about using hardware-based uh, telemetry, right? So because of the ability we have on our switches where we can look deep into the packet, we're able to detect these gaps. So you can, the whole amount of time you, tr you spend troubleshooting can be brought down to seconds, yes. Can you inspect anything else, looking into iframes or anything, or can, can you do anything that is not out of the beam? Correct. So the question is, hey, is there anything additional that you can do even for non-RTP frames? The answer is today, this feature works solely for RTP because it covers most use cases. And again, one of the, while ASICs are brilliant when it comes to throughput, we can do, we can do this at scale. Like I can monitor 24,000 flows without impacting performance. The ASICs have limited functionality, right? It can only look, it can only do so much. So we cannot go deep into the packet. We can go up to the headers. We can't look at the payload. We cannot do any kind of MPEG. By the way, this also works for compressed streams, right? You could use this feature, it's not just uncompressed. Even today, compressed use RTP, so you can use it, but we cannot go beyond 
the RTP header to the payload. So it's limited functionality, but at least this tells you if the network is dropping packet, exactly where it is dropping it and so on. So that's the demo. And finally, I was talking to you about PTP monitoring. Uh, you know, we can do that as well. Save on DCNM. I click on it. All right, stop complaining. OK. Oh, it actually took me to that licensing page. Yeah, All right, PTP monitoring. Let me go to the data center. OK, so it's as it, you see, it's actually monitoring how much is the switch clock drifting from the grandmaster. And see, overall, the switch clock is quite good. It's within 100 nanoseconds. And you can create alerts, right? If the offset goes beyond 150 nanoseconds, again, this is just for the, typically you want to set that value to like one microsecond because if something bad happens, it only happens if it goes beyond a microsecond, you can generate an alert. And again, this alert can be sent from DCNM to any third party system like Clavo Smart. It's completely open. So one of the things that we've done with our solution, IP Fabric for Media or NX service, it's completely open. You can bring your data miners, you can bring your EWIRTS controller, Lava Smart, we don't care. We will expose this information to them, okay? Even if there's some vendor that you guys work with that you haven't seen, let us know. We can share that same document with them so that they can integrate with Cisco. So not only you can monitor flows, statistics, RTP, you can also monitor timing with our solution. So with that, you know, quickly going back to the PPT. All right, we've spoken about all this, so I'll just skip these slides. Yeah, I just want to conclude with uh, use real world use cases. So uh, this is an actual use case where customer has built a, you know, a spine and leaf network. Uh, they, yeah, this is a newsrooms just like the SIC Portugal. They also have newsrooms, but just telling you, right, it's, it's with Grass Valley. Again, the same, they use NBM, they use PTP monitoring, they use DCNM and so on. And we also have Obi Trucks. Obi Trucks goes with a single big box. This was Arena TV. Uh, they made history, right? This was in 2016, they produced the first ever game in 4K over IP. So it was cool to be involved in that project amongst the first in the world. This is uh, another customer. You see, we are kind of going into this domain of mixing production as well as storage on the same fabric. These customers have been brave enough to do it. If you ask Cisco, I'll say, go ahead, no problem. We have QoS. If you go ask Grass Valley, you go ask Ewerts, you go ask Lava, they'll say no. This is a dedicated environment for production. Don't put anything file-based on that fabric, right? And then, Unfortunately, we couldn't do it in this Cisco Live, but in US last year, all of this production that was done for Cisco Live actually ran on IP Fabric for Media. So we did production. So it's like using our own technology, and it's a proud moment to see our CEO leverage a technology that we created, right? So we, that's to show you guys that we trust our own technology so we can put a flagship event like Cisco Live over IP. And we're going to do this in US. So if you visit us in Cisco Live US, you will see the entire production for Cisco TV would be done on, on IP using our technology. So with that, uh, you know, I mean, post-production, not so important. You know, I really wanted to spend some time uh, on production itself. So very quickly, if I, I'll just skip a few slides. I'll just leave the slides for reference so you can always come back to it. I just want to, you know, share with you uh, what is it, right? What are the biggest takeaways from this session? So if you look at you know, the biggest challenges, again, if I have to reiterate, as you transition from SDI to IP for production, always think about reliability. How do you make this entire environment reliable? How do you basically distribute timing through PTP? And how can you efficiently troubleshoot? Because the reality is things will fail. You know, I don't want to make you the promise saying that, ah, nothing was going to fail. The reality is things will fail, but when something bad happens, how quickly can you react to that problem and solve it, right? So that's the summary of what I would like to share with you. And this brings me to the end of my session. Uh, you know, don't forget to, I keep, yeah, they keep reminding me, please complete your surveys. Let us know 
what you felt about the session, it, it helps me as well. And uh, I'm going to be here. Of course, we'll have to leave the room because there's another session immediately. But if you want to have a follow-up, you know, you have something that uh, you want to talk to me about, I'm going to be here. But again, guys, thank you for staying back on this Thursday evening. I know like, Cisco Live can be exhausting. But I hope you got something from this session. And I really enjoyed interacting with all of you all. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank <laughs> you.